Hello, Pure Art family. So glad you could join us online today. If you're part of our online experience on Facebook, you can click a like, share this video with a friend, or share to your own Facebook page. I've seen many of you have started watch parties of your own on Facebook and invited your friends to join and watch in the service with you. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And those of you who are jumped on Facebook on the mainstream, we would love for you to jump in and join the chat. Share a prayer request or things God's doing in your life, or even how the message is affecting and impacting your life. This weekend, we roll into a brand new series called What's Right With The World. Now, I know some of you have just heard that title, What's Right With The World, and your response may have been, well, not very much this year. But I think that's exactly why today's message in this series is gonna impact and encourage your life. Also, during the service, we'll be doing communion. So go ahead and grab some of those communion elements. Some of you may not have the specific juice or bread, but go ahead and grab what you can. Maybe that means breaking out a roll of the Ritz crackers or some random Triscuits. And for parents, I'm pretty sure that also includes goldfish. But here we go. We're going to take this time together and refocus and encourage our hearts. Cast out fear and lies from our mind. And we're going to lean in, grab our Bibles. Let's open our Bible apps and let's worship together. Let's grow together, become more like Jesus for the sake of others. Welcome to church. Welcome, we're so glad that you're joining us. No matter where you happen to be viewing from, if you want to stand up, if you want to just give God praise, join us in worshiping Him. We're so glad that you're joining us. Come on, in, in your living room, put your hands together. Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it arise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it Yeah. 
lift you up. We praise you. We love you. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the King.
there's none like you, Jesus. None like you, Jesus. We worship you. declaration with me.
your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise you only to you only do we give our praise God Thank you for your goodness and who you are in our lives, God. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one you can. You turn so true. There is nothing in our life that compares with you. We worship you, God. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence in our hearts and in our worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. As part of our worship, we love to pray for other churches that we partner alongside with. And today we want to lift up the church that's big house, Pastor Jeff Schellenberger. Jeff has been around our lives for a long time. He was a youth pastor at Pure Heart several years back and uh, he's just a great guy doing some wonderful things with his church and through his church. Let's bow our heads and pray for Jeff. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Pastor Jeff and his entire church, God, and what they're doing. That Through COVID-19, God, you are sustaining them and they are doing amazing things, trusting you, God, day by day, weekend after weekend. We ask that you pour your blessings upon them, Father. Continue to sustain them. Let them do all the things that they're doing to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Pure Heart family, we are so glad you are connecting with us today. Over the last few months, it has been awesome as we have leaned into our online experience to see how God has expanded the reach of Pure Heart all around the world. And during that time, we have seen over 400 people come to Christ. If you're one of those people, then your next step is baptism. Baptism is a public profession of what God has done in your heart and life. We have begun having baptisms again on our campuses. But what if you live somewhere else in the world? Then we want to help you figure out how to approach that next step. So if you're interested in getting baptized, no matter where you live, then email baptism at pureheart.org so we can connect with you. Also, if you have a story about being baptized during these crazy times that we've been going through, we would love to hear it. So you can share your story at that same email as well.
And for everyone continuing to move forward with your relationship with Christ, we have groups and discipleship ramping and launching for the fall. And yes, we have connection opportunities for those of you online as well. So don't walk alone. Find a way to be connected in community. For more information on getting connected, you can visit pureheart.org forward slash grow events. Also, just a reminder that Pastor Dan will be doing communion at the end of the message. If you are a follower of Christ, we want to encourage you to join in. If you have not had the chance to grab those communion elements, then go ahead and take a second to do so. And if you don't have the exact elements, that's okay. Go ahead and grab what you can and remember what Christ did for us. Welcome to Pure Heart. We're so glad that you joined us today. You have just dropped into a church that not only sees with Jesus' eyes, but has a heart to make a difference. We don't just wanna love people, we wanna see people's lives absolutely changed for the better. This is a church where we say it is okay to not be okay. You do not have to pretend and you don't have to stay stuck. This is a place where you can be honest and you can be real because we have real issues in this world, but we have a real God who cares about those issues and can transform those difficult things in our life and bring good out of bad situations. Thank you for being here with us today. We're so excited to get to know who you are and we want you to get to know who we are. God bless you. I want to welcome everybody online today. We are so glad that you are joining us. Also, friends and family of mine from around the country, thank you for tuning in, especially my family in the Midwest, in Central Illinois and Wisconsin. Love you guys so much. Also, I want to thank Crossroads for tuning in. Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys, and we're standing with you in your recovery. We're in it with you. And then I want to say a big shout out to the Peoria campus. All everybody at the Peoria campus, so glad that you're tuning in with us today as well. We're starting a brand new series this week, a brand new series, a three-part series. And I want you to understand, I'm especially concerned right now. The reason I'm doing this series is I'm especially concerned about the mental health of so many people in our world today. People are dealing with all kinds of anxiety. We're dealing with all kinds of fears. We have election fears. We have uh, recession fears. We have social unrest fears. We have COVID-19 death tolls every day by the news media all over our TVs that we're watching. We have media fears. The media is just working us up into a frenzy according to their little political bent, whichever way it goes, making us scared and afraid of everything that's going on in the world today. I started 2020. This, probably the most, this has probably been one of the most difficult years of my life. I started 2020 with two of my very close friends having two of their children pass away, one from a drug overdose, the other from a drowning. I did their memorials, and as, as powerful as the lives of these two young people were, it was heartbreaking to see them go home to heaven so early. That's how my year started in January, and then in February, that my, my second friend lost her daughter, his daughter, and then COVID-19 and race riots and curfews. I, listen, I haven't had a curfew since I was 17 years old. In 2020, I had an eight o'clock curfew here in Arizona. Then wildfires and then record heat. And then on our staff, uh, one of our staff members, husband, young husband passed away unexpectedly. It just seemed to be out of nowhere. And I watched our team rally around her and love her and her kids. And then, and then more social unrest on TV. And then the crazy, probably the craziest election of our lifetime. And in my mind, there's times I just go, come on, God, what is going on with 2020? And I know that many of you, you know that and you, you've heard me talk about that. It's just, it's not an easy year for so many of us. I was talking to Pastor Bob and Lori Hake the other day. They called me from their vacation. They were so excited. They said, we have a series title for you. And they gave me this title. And this is the title for the series for the next three weeks in the month of September. With all the craziness that's going on in the world, here's our series title. What's right with the world? That's right. You heard it. I'm not crazy. What's right with the world? Not that we're going to ignore what's wrong in the world right now. 
But we're going to focus, we're going to focus in on what is right with the world right now. The spiritual discipline, if you will, one of the greatest ways that God has designed us to stay healthy in our souls, to stay healthy in our minds, to focus on what is right, what is good, if you will. Because where my, my old pastor growing up used to always say this, Tommy Barnett used to say, where the focus goes, the energy flows. It is so true. Let me say that again. Where the focus flow, where the focus goes, the energy flows. We're going to spend the rest of September in a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, the letter of Philippians. It's in the New Testament. I would love for you to start going there right now. We're going to be in chapter 4 in just a moment. Now understand the background of this. Anytime I I, I read from one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, I like to give you a little background. And here's the background. Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. I believe he wrote four different prison epistles. This is one of the four. He's in prison right now. Paul went through all kinds of painful things in his life. He's been shipwrecked. He was beaten with rods. He was left for dead outside the city after they stoned him with rocks. He faced all kinds of massive rejection for those that he loved dearly and different church leaders turned on him. Now he finds himself in prison and he writes this letter at the end of his life. He knows he's about to go home to heaven. He's about to leave this life for the best life. He knows he's about to die, and he sits down to write a letter to his close friends in the city of Philippi. Now, I want you to understand as we dive into this letter, these are some of Paul's final words. And there's something about final words. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of someone that you care about deeply being there at their bedside, maybe when they pass from this life to the next, and you were able to share some final words words with him. I can promise you now, you never forgot those words. These are some final words from Paul that he pours out to his friends, and we have the benefit of being impacted by sitting here today in the 21st century. So here's what we're going to be doing during this series. A couple things. Number one, we are going to memorize, that's right, another series with a memory verse. We are going to memorize Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. It's one of of my life verses. Philippians chapter 4 and and verse 8. I'll be there in just a moment. The second thing is, we are going to read through the entire letter this month in our personal prayer times. That's right. All month long, I'm, every week I'm going to give you a reading. So this week's reading, get ready to write this down. Get ready. All right, take a screenshot of this. This week's reading is Philippians chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 18. Did you get that? Philippians chapter 1 through Philippians chapter 2, verse 18. And then every Tuesday for the next three weeks, this coming Tuesday, every Tuesday, I'm going to go live on on my Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to go live and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do devotional talking about and kind of unpacking some of these amazing perspective moments where Paul's in a wrong, bad, difficult circumstance, and yet he sees what's right what's beautiful about what he's going through. We're going to be blown away by Paul's perspective in the midst of a difficult circumstance. Now, we need power for perspective. It takes power to have this kind of perspective. We just finished a series on a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to lean into him during the series and ask him to empower us to give us his perspective as we go about our days. This is what perspective means to me. I love this. I wrote this down this week. I love this. Perspective is this, the ability to see past my first thought. Did you catch it? The ability to see past my first thought. Because some of us right now are having a really difficult time seeing past our first thought. Our, our prejudices, if you will, our frustrations, if you will, our own filters, whether it's politically or things that we've gone through in our past, or our, our broken, our wounded, our wounded soul. We're filtering life through our brokenness. We're filtering life through our political perspectives, and we have a hard time getting past our first thought. This week, I'm going to be laying a foundation that's going to last for the rest of this series. So please lean in with me today. The definition of perspective is this. It's an attitude towards something or someone. Did you catch that? An attitude towards something or someone. It's a point of view, if you will. So we're going to dive right in to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. That's where we're going to start. So here we go. Let's read this together. All right. Paul's in prison. Don't forget this. Paul's in prison. He knows he's about to die, and this is what he writes in this verse, chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is, say it with me, 
right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's a powerful verse. So I want to unpack this for just a little bit. Here we go. Starting from the very beginning of this, of this verse again. Finally, brothers and sisters. See, I believe that this verse 8 is central to the entire letter to the Philippian church. Of all four chapters, this is a conclusion statement. It's, it's like Paul was saying this, finally, meaning Paul's saying, everything I've been writing can be summed up in this next statement. Pay close attention. He wraps up four chapters in this one verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, and he goes on, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy. It's like, it's like Paul saying, no matter what's going wrong around you, don't get stuck there. Look deeper than that. Go past your first thought. Don't get stuck. Or I'll say it this way. Don't allow yourself to continue to be triggered by what's happening in our world today. I, I do this and some of you watching online are like, why did you do that? We have a great illustration in our church. We talk about being a trauma-informed church. And this is what we know about when someone gets into a place where they're overwhelmed or they're upset. Consider this to be your brain. Put your hand out like this is your brain. This is your amygdala. This is where all your emotions are at. Your, this is the feeling part of your mind. The rest, these four fingers, this is the cortex of your brain. The cortex of your brain wraps around and squeezes the amygdala. And so when, when your brain is healthy, when our minds are healthy, we're doing good. We look like this. But when bad things are happening, we get triggered. And then when we get triggered, this whole vortex that can, can govern our amygdala is now released. And now all we're doing is living by our emotions. And we can get stuck in our emotions. And we can get stuck in our first thought. And Paul's like, don't get stuck there. And he goes on. This is so good. He says this. Think about such things. Now, Please, please listen. The Greek term for think about, the original language of the New Testament was the Greek language. It was written in the Greek language. This Greek word that Paul uses for this idea to think about literally means to take inventory. To take inventory of not just, not just a passing thought or let these thoughts kind of float through your mind. No, 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 no. Be incredibly intentional and take inventory inventory of these things, these things that are true and noble and what is right and what is pure and lovely and admirable and anything that is excellent or praiseworthy. Take inventory of those things in your life. Man, if, you've, if you've ever struggled with addiction, you get this. In AA, we have the, what's called the 12 steps. What's step number 10? Step number 10 is to take inventory and if you've done something that you know is wrong, admit it as quickly as possible. Take inventory of your own heart. Take inventory of your own actions. And if something is wrong, then go make it right. And Paul's taking a little twist on that. Paul's saying, no, no, listen, I want you to yeah, deal with those things that are wrong. Don't, don't not deal with them. Paul's saying, now I want you to begin to think about and I want you to admit the right things that are happening in your life. The excellent, praiseworthy, good things that are taking place in your life. That's what Paul's saying. Let me, let me talk about inventory this way. How many of you maybe um, worked a retail job? I know my brother for years was in the grocery business, and he used to hate taking inventory. But all great companies get an A-plus in the area of taking inventory. That way they can see what's being stolen from them, what is missing from them. They, every month, Paul, when he worked for Sprouts, they had to take inventory every single month. And great managers, great leaders did a great job at taking inventory, knowing what was available in the store, knowing what you had, what resources you had, and knowing if you're missing anything or anything's being stolen from you to take inventory. Taking inventory is looking past your current circumstances to see what God is up to to see what he is putting right that has been wrong in your life. A great friend of mine, Mike Delster, and his wonderful wife, Emily. Emily recently, her mom went home to be with Jesus. 
And I was at the memorial service, the celebration of her, of her mom's life, Betsy. And it was a powerful memorial service, a powerful celebration of life. Mike did a phenomenal job honoring his mother-in-law. Um, Betsy used to sit at the Glendale campus when I was preaching off to my left. Emily would bring her. She was dealing with a severe level of dementia. And Emily just loved her mom deeply and really honored her and walked her from this life to the next. And with COVID-19, there was time towards the end where she wasn't able to be with her. It was a really difficult time for her. And at the memorial service, Emily got up and she talked about her mom. And she just did an amazing job of just celebrating her mom's life. And I will never forget this statement that she made. She was talking about different quotes that her mom would give. And she said, one night my mom was giving a talk at Young Life with a whole bunch of high school students. And she said, this is what my mom said about sunrises. She says, sunrises are the prettiest when the air is the dirtiest because God is in the business of redeeming the dirt. I, I just have to read that again. Sunrises are the prettiest when the air is the dirtiest because God is in the business of redeeming the dirt the dirt. You see, God is in the business of putting wrong things right. He, he, through his spirit, is in the business of helping us by his power in the midst of all the difficult things that are going on around us and as triggered as many of us are to be able to focus in on and take inventory of those things that are lovely, that are right, that are true, that are pure, that are admirable, that are excellent, that are praiseworthy. And when we do this, it transforms our soul. It heals our minds, regulates our hearts, if you will. A friend of mine, Heath Bottomley, sent me this video the other day. Um, it's called From Beauty, From Brokenness to Beauty. Young lady and young artist, young teenage artist, she was, takes x-rays of broken bones and she paints on them and turns these broken images into something beautiful. I want you to take a moment and catch her perspective right now. I don't consider myself an artist or an inspiration. I just consider myself maybe like a dreamer. Painting up on the roof kind of allows me to escape from busyness of the city and focus. I get to see all of the chaos and all of the movement around me, but I get to go at my own pace. I started painting on x-rays because I needed a canvas that people would pay attention to rather than focusing on my artwork. That gives me time to prepare myself for when they say, so what does this mean? It's almost like a personal thing to me, what it means or, or why you put it together. It's almost like you don't want to share it. It's your own little secret. Somebody probably looked at this x-ray with, with so much anxiety that they have this deformity or this disfigurement for the rest of their life, and I take it and make it something that people will enjoy. don't go in and show somebody an x-ray and say, look at how healthy I am. You want to see the tragedy in it. You, it the x-rays are the only things that, you, uh, that I can really think about that you want to see what's wrong with it. The perfect ones are the ones that get thrown away. The more broken an x-ray is, the more excited I get to paint on it. You can actually see there's a picture of that pain. I don't think that that should be hidden. It's beautiful in itself. I lost my father when I was 15, and I think a lot of times people will use that as an excuse to kind of just completely go off the path that they're on. But to me, I had an incredible amazing, encouraging father for 15 years of my life, which is more than most people can say for their living fathers. So I think there's always something broken and you can always take it and put it into a positive. And that's the way that you, you rise up. You really can't experience happiness and 
until you've experienced pain, because then you're able to compare the difference. The line that caught my heart the most in that video was, she said, my father died when I was 15 years old. And then she said this, so good. But I had a great father for 15 years in my life. Most don't get to have a great father for that long in a lifetime. My father died when I was 15, but perspective, beautiful, lovely, excellent, praiseworthy things. But I had a great dad for 15 years and a lot of people around me won't get that in a lifetime. What a powerful, powerful perspective. Now, I'm not going to be able on the weekend services and on online, I'm not going to be able to go through all four chapters of Philippians. I'm not going to be able to do that. That's why we're doing those personal devotional times during the week. And I'm going to tune in with you on Tuesdays for the next three weeks and kind of unpack chapters one through four and pick out some highlights as we go along. But during this series for the next three weeks, I'm going to be unpacking verses four through nine of Philippians chapter four. We're going to dive into verses four through nine. Today, I want to take a look at verses 4 and 5. Let's check this out together. Here we go. So Paul goes on, verse 4. He says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> you know what the hardest part of that statement is? Always. Are you kidding me? Always? When things are really bad, God? When there's all these kinds of stuff going on, I'm supposed to rejoice? Yeah, rejoice in the Lord always. And he says this, I will say it again, rejoice. This word rejoice in the Greek language has the def- is defined this way, to be calmly happy. I love that. It doesn't mean that when difficult things are going on, going on and life is crashing down around you, you're like, woo! thank you, God, may I have another? No, that's, that's just weird, okay? That, that's not, that's just strange. No, to rejoice means this way down deep inside, there's this joy that runs deeper than happiness because happiness depends on happenings. Happiness depends on our circumstances. And Paul says there's a joy that can be so deep, it can cause us to be calmly happy. To be calmly happy. I love that. Something about seeing the good in things and rejoicing in the things that are right transforms us. Joy strengthens us. But here's the truth. Some people struggle big time. They struggle big time with rejoicing. It reminds me of the old story of the farmer. He had a, this farmer in Illinois. He had um, a neighbor who was super grumpy, just the, the meanest, grumpiest neighbor. Couldn't find good in anything of his life, depended on it. One day, he and the grumpy neighbor were out by the pond on the backside of his farm, and they're hanging out there by the, by the pond, and he looked down at his dog. He says, hey, he says, you see this dog right here? He goes, nobody in the world has a dog as good as this. This dog is the best stick-fetching dog in the world. And the farmer took, this, took a stick, picked it up, threw it out in the middle of the, middle of the pond. The dog doesn't even go in the water. He runs on top of the water, picks up the stick, runs all the way back on top of the water, drops the stick off at the farmer's feet, and just sits there. Didn't splash any water on anybody because he didn't get in the water. He ran on top of the water, and he looked at the grumpy neighbor. He said, what do you think about that dog? And the grumpy old neighbor goes, man, how sad is that? Your dog can't even swim. I know, that's the first old, I have two for you. He thought that was good. I have a second one for you, all right? Little old lady living in Texas, way down southern Texas. She was so poor. She was broke. And so every day she'd go out on her porch and she would ask God for provision. She had a mean, an absolutely mean neighbor lady that lived next door. This neighbor lady hated that she prayed every morning. She hated that she trusted God because she didn't believe in God at all. And so one day this mean neighbor lady, she went and bought a whole bunch of groceries she brought him over to this, to this old lady's house. She set him on the porch, and then she ran around the corner and hid behind a bush. Little old lady comes out on the porch. She looks down and sees all the groceries. She gets so happy, so excited, throws her hands in the air and says, Thank you, Jean. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. The mean lady jumped out from behind the bush. She goes, God didn't give you those groceries. I gave you those groceries. And without skipping a beat, the little old lady, she lifted her hands back up to heaven. She says, I praise you, God, for your provision, and thank you for making the devil pay for it. It's a great joke right there. You know that is a great joke right there. Some people just have a really hard time rejoicing. And some people, even in their worst circumstances, 
can find something to praise God about. They can just have a totally different perspective than what the average person would think about their current circumstances. And so Paul goes on in verse 5, and this is what he says. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. To which you're like, wait a minute, God. You mean everybody? When you say all, you mean like everybody. Because there's some people in my life that I don't really feel like being gentle with. And have you noticed these days that people are struggling with being gentle? My wife works at a local high school here in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. And right now, all of our students in our our school districts are online. And parents are losing their minds. And every day, my wife, she told me, I was talking to her today. She said, she goes, she was driving home. She called me and I said, what's going on? She goes, how was your day? She goes, it's kind of tough. She goes, I get yelled at a lot. And now people are just so triggered with all the politics around this whole thing with COVID-19. She says, I just spend a lot of my day being yelled at on the phone. People are having a hard time being gentle because so many of us are triggered right now. You say, Paul, how am I able to, how can I be gentle to all? How is that going to be possible? You can't mean all. Come on, Paul. And now Paul gives us an all-powerful perspective. And this is where I'm going to land in week one of this series. And Paul's next words are life-changing if we can get our heart around it. And this is what he said. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Say that with me. Because the Lord is near. When I was growing up, sometimes when I would, was getting in trouble I'd be reminded by an aunt or uncle or a grandparent or my mom and dad. Um, they would look at me and they'd go, remember, God's watching. Remember, God's watching. But listen to me. When Paul writes this statement, the Lord is near, it's so much deeper than just, don't forget, God's watching. Be nice, be gentle, be kind, because God's watching you. No, no, no. It's so much deeper than that. So much deeper than that. No, it's deeper. It's closer than that. It's closer than God's watching because he's saying in all, when everything in my world is going wrong, here's what I've come to understand. Paul's saying, when the world seems to be falling down around me and I find myself in prison and Nero is the emperor and I know he's about to take my life and I'm about to leave this life for heaven, when everything is falling down around me, here's what is a perspective changing thing for me. I remember that God is near. This is so foundational. This is a foundational perspective of what is right in the world for us as followers of Jesus Christ. The thing that can be, that is so right, that can be no more right, if you will, is that God is always with me. And what you have to understand about this word near is it doesn't mean that God's just watching me. Because uh, let's be honest about that. If that's my understanding that God is, is watching me, I'm even more frustrated about that. Like, God, if if you're watching, if if you're standing near me and you're watching all this stuff go down, why don't you do something? Why don't you change it? Why don't you fix it? Why don't you take it away? It has to be more intimate than just God is standing nearby me and he's watching me. And it is. Because this Greek term This understanding, this word for near was so much deeper than just God is standing nearby watching. What it actually means is this. Ready for the definition? It means this, that God is at hand. Or literally, this is so good. I'd never, I've I've read the letter to the Philippian church more than any other letter in the New Testament. I've studied, I've gone through it verse by verse over and over again in my last 25, 25 years of ministry. I had never caught this before. Never. I'm so excited about it. God is at hand, and literally, from the root, the root Greek word here, the root word, it means this, to squeeze. God is at hand, and to squeeze. That God literally takes my hand, and he squeezes it. Such a powerful picture. When our kids were little, we get out of the car at the mall or at the Walmart or grocery store, Cars whipping all around and 
metro Phoenix area, especially at Walmart, crazy at Walmart. We get out of the car and we get them out of their car seats and they're just little guys and they start to run around, run in place. And the first thing I would do is I'd reach down like this and they'd grab my hand and I would squeeze it. There's danger. You got to be careful. Joshua, Luke, Abigail, give me your hand. And I'd squeeze it. And we would walk through the dangerous parking lot and I'd direct them into the store. See, this idea of that God is at hand and this idea that he's taking my hand and he's squeezing it is a powerful, powerful picture. As a matter of fact, in my office, I have a painting. I'm going to show it to you right now. I want you to take a look at this painting. This, is, this painting is in my office. It's a picture of a little child's hand inside of the hand of a father. To me, it's one of the greatest images that I have in my office. I have it in front of my desk area. So when I'm sitting at my desk, no matter what I'm going through, especially in 2020 with all the decisions that have to have been made, I love to just stop and look at that picture. To see that picture, that little child's hand resting in that father's hand. I want you to take a moment right now and I want you to look at it. I'm actually just going to be quiet for just a moment, for a few seconds. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What, what emotions come to your mind? What, what rolls through your heart? Just look at this picture for just a moment. I believe some of you right now, you desperately need this imagery from Paul. You definitely need to understand what the Lord is near means in a deep, deep way. My wife, Nicole, and I have this little interesting ritual that we do, especially when we're out in public and we're not able to talk privately. Um, I may have shared this over the years. Some of you may have already heard me talk about this, but we have this thing where if we're in a, in a crowd or we're at a dinner with other, other people and um, I'll just reach over, I'll take her hand and I squeeze her hand three times and then I squeeze it three times, which means I love you. And then she squeezes my hand back twice, which means me too. I can't tell you over the 22 years of marriage how many times we've done that. Sometimes when I finish teaching and she's at church, uh, maybe on a Saturday night or if she comes on Sunday morning, I'll, I'll leave the stage. It'll be a closing song and I'll, I'll walk over, stand next to her and I'll reach down and take her hand and she squeezes my hand three times. I love you. And I get to squeeze her hand back. Me too. But just that little human contact of I love you and me too regulated my mind, calmed my heart. When I first started doing hospital calls years ago as a youth pastor, I remember going to visit the first person I went to see. Her name was Joy. She had uh, stomach cancer. I remember driving down. I was probably only 21 years of age, and I was in over my head. I'm like, what, what am I going to say to this, this woman who's lived 82 years, and now she's about to leave this life. She's dealing with stomach cancer. God, how am I going to comfort her? What am I going to say? And all the way down, I just started praying. I said this, Lord, would you please comfort joy through me? Would you please give me your heart and your ability to love her? I don't know what to say. Would you just help me to love her? I remember I checked in at the front desk and they told me what room she was. And I went up the second floor and got out of the elevator. I'll never forget my very first hospital call. Um, joy was incredibly sick. She was at end stages of cancer. Her skin tone had completely changed. Um, she was a mere shadow of herself of what she was before weight-wise. And I sat down next to the bed. And once again, I whispered that prayer. Oh God, would you love me through her? Would you, Lord, would you help me to encourage her and to comfort her? And in that moment, the Lord put the strong impression on my heart. And he said, I want you to take her by the hand. And the the motivation of my heart, the movement of my heart, the pulling of my heart was to in, just reach out and to take her hand. That was the heart of the Father through me. What do I say to her? What do I do? What answers do I have for her? How can I possibly comfort her? Dan, take her hand. Let her know that you are near. And I just squeezed it. And as I squeezed it, she squeezed mine back. And we just sat there for about 20 minutes. 
I prayed with her. I listened to her. When I got done, she looked at me with her big brown eyes and she said, thank you for coming to see me, youth pastor. It meant a lot to me. Thank you for loving me. Just hold my hand. And Paul's sitting in prison. He knows his life is about to be over. He's been shipwrecked and beaten and abandoned by so many people. And when he writes this letter, he says that rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And here's why. Because I've discovered something. In all the wrong that I've been through, in the wrong I'm facing right now in prison, the Lord has taken my hand. And he's walking me through from this life to the next. And some of you today, you need God to take you by the hand. You know that you need his comfort, you need his encouragement, you need his strength. For others of you today, for the first time in your life, you need to squeeze his hand back and say, me too. On the cross, when he stretched out his hands to lay down his life for you, when he did this, he said, I love you. And today, for the first time in your life, or maybe today is a rededication of your love for Christ, you need to squeeze that hand back and say, me too. I love you in return. And so if today you need to ask Jesus to lead your life, if today you need to respond to his love, then this is the greatest moment and the greatest decision of your life. And I want to take a moment right now and I want to pray with you. So maybe it's a first time to make this decision or maybe it's a rededication of your life to Christ. I don't know what it is you and Jesus know, but if you're ready to make that decision today to commit your life to him, then pray this with me right now. Just say this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. Lord, I need you to take me by the hand. I need you to walk me through the pain of my life. I need you to be my savior, my leader, my hero, my healer. I need you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Just let him know that. Forgive me of my sin. You know what it is, and I give it to you right now. Thank you for forgiving me. Now ask him this, Jesus, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you fill me with your presence, with your hope, with your love, with your joy, with your peace? In Jesus' name, amen. Greatest decision of your life. Now, friends, I know in the beginning, um, Pastor Matt told you that we were going to be taking communion together. And so if you've got that bread and you've, you've got that juice and you're ready to go, then let's take communion together. And here's the thought I want us to think about. I want us to meditate on this as we get ready to receive communion today. Communion is celebrating the fact that Jesus came near, that God came near to us in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. And so as you hold that bread right now, I want you just to take a moment and say, Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken for me. In my brokenness, in my pain, in my hurt, your brokenness has been able to put me back together and I need you to heal me. And I thank you for the promise of healing. And go ahead and eat that bread right now. And I'll take that cup, that juice that represents his blood that was shed for you. And I want you to just hold that cup right now and say this, Lord Jesus, thank you for pouring out your blood to cover over my shame, cover over my sin. I receive this now, thanking you for your incredible love for me. Go ahead and receive that cup now. Family, I love you dearly. I'm so honored that you would tune in with us today. We have two more weeks in this series. We're gonna dive deeper into this letter of Philippians. I encourage you, be reading this next week. Be reading, remember, Philippians chapter one through chapter two, verse 18. And then check out what I'm gonna be doing this week on social media as we cover some highlights of Paul's perspective this coming Tuesday. Love you, family. Have a strong week. Pure Heart Family. 
We've shared with you so many of the exciting stories coming out of our Life Bridge at Pure Heart Resource Center during the last few months. And I mentioned over the last couple weeks that we've been leaning into helping our community's tangible and physical needs right now. These needs have been magnified ever since COVID has affected all of our lives. And so we've been partnering with and training other churches and nonprofits, teaching them how to connect people and families who are struggling to resources that are available to them. Resources such as housing and medical services, allowing these people to stand in the gap for the working poor, the single moms, the disabled, the homeless, the elderly, the people the Bible calls us to watch out for. This is what I love. As we've leaned into helping others, ultimately God is the one who gets the credit. Here's a couple more things that God's allowing us to do that's so exciting. We have partnered with St. Mary's Food Bank as a mobile pantry partner. St. Mary's is the largest distributor targeting food scarcity in Arizona. They meet the needs of tens of thousands of people across our state. But our newly expanded level of partnership with them is allowing St. Mary's to more effectively serve some of the needs of neighborhoods that have been identified as underserved and marginalized for food distribution across the city. And also alongside our School Connect initiative, LifeBridge at Pure Heart has also been able to target five specific local schools in underserved neighborhoods that we're beginning to partner directly with them to help them address the needs of family populations that they serve, targeting specifically food scarcity, issues of parental support, teacher support, and student support, especially, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, helping under-resourced families who are struggling with the digital divide in school right now. Opening access points at our Pure Heart Glendale campus and our downtown LifeBridge Glendale location for those kids to get internet access, to be able to do their schoolwork online. Family, we are grateful, we are so grateful that God has allowed Pure Heart to continue to answer the question, if we were gone tomorrow, would our community miss us? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace that you've allowed us to pour out into ways in the community and, and around us that we never expected, we never imagined. God, we thank you that each and every person as they are giving, God, you're blessing them, you're blessing their tithes and offerings, Lord. Let it go to impact and grow and let more people know about you, God, to reach the needs of hurting and struggling families, God. And those who are without jobs right now, God, those who are struggling financially themselves, God, bless them, touch them, provide for them in the name of Jesus. So as you put your tithes and offerings in the mail, as you're giving online, text to give or in the Pure Heart app, know that these are the types of things your faithfulness is going to support. Thank you, family, for your continued support of Pure Heart and the ministries we've been able to partner with. This God's expanding our reach across the nation and the world, letting us stand in the gaps and be the hands and feet of Christ. So be encouraged. Have an amazing week and keep your focus on Him as we continue to love like Christ for the sake of others in new and exciting ways. We'll see you next week.